Welcome to Zambition, the channel on which we engage in dialogue with leaders from across sectors and generations. Greetings and welcome to this special edition of Zambition. My name is Martin Kalungubanda, your host on this channel. And our guest today is someone who needs no introduction. Her name is Professor Nkanduluo. She has served as a minister in different portfolios across government. Prior to that, she was an academic teaching at the University of Zambia. Professor, welcome to Zambition. Thank you so much, Martin. It's really an honor and a privilege to be on this show. My first question is to do with an image or object or a description that best represents who you are and what are the two to three most defining moments in your life? Uh, although I think uh, a lot of people seem to know me, but I think they don't know the real Professor Nkandlu. And uh, I think for me, one of the things that has been very critical in my life is how I've had the opportunity to be exposed to the real lives of people in Zambia. And this all started when I first came back from training abroad. And um, I was exposed to the first ever case of HIV and AIDS. And uh, together with three other professors, Professor Andeli, Professor Iria, and Professor Chintu, we discovered the first case. What this did in terms of trying to put up a response to HIV, it also exposed me to the real impact that this was having on people's lives. And uh, what I've seen during my struggles trying to mitigate against HIV and this has seen me how people really struggle in life. And uh, the impact of HIV was not health, but social economic. We saw child-headed households, grandparent-headed households, female-headed households, and the poverty levels was very striking. So this, in fact, has been one of the things that uh, has defined me because I've always wanted to work for the Zambian people to get them out of abject poverty and also to remove them from certain activities that expose them to further suffering such as those women that uh, I had to remove from the street, the commercial sex workers, the child marriage. That's why I started the campaign against child marriage. And uh, I think when we look at uh, things that have been defining for me, starts with the fact that, um, you know, we were born girls. And uh, of course, you know, in Africa, the, the boy child is more appreciated than the girl child. And I think my father can be credited to have been one of the very early people that was very gender sensitive because he told us as girls that I want to invest everything that I have in you to show that even girls can actually do well in life and can even do better than men. That was one thing that actually shaped us, not only myself as a girl, but even my sisters, because there are six of us. The second thing for me that I think is very defining is, um, you know, the fact that when I became the first woman professor, you know, the whole Zambia just uh, started uh, vibrating and uh, congratulating me. But uh, when I thought about it, I said, the universities and lecturers have been around for such a long, long time. 
And I know that there were women who had published as much as I had published. Why would, was it easy for the men to be made professors and us girls, we had to struggle? Because at the time I became a professor, I actually had a 40 page CV and I'd published more than anybody else because I started publishing even as a student of PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And uh, that's why I decided as one of my very, very important um, activity is to be one of those that actually fight for gender equity. And then the third thing that uh, I think for me has been defining is uh, just the poverty that I saw when I traveled around the country mitigating and doing our programs. And this is why what even attracted me to join the Patriotic Front, because Patriotic Front said it's a pro-poor party. And I wanted to be with a team of men and women that will address the poverty levels in the country and make lives better for the Zambian people. Thank you very much, Professor. My next question is, what is your view on what got us here, however you understand here, as a nation? And what are the deeper issues that we need to address as a country going forward? Well, I, I think, Martin, I would like to go into the history of Zambia uh, in trying to talk about, but they will understand what has brought us here. And uh, when um, Zambia got its independence, those of uh, Zambians who take interest to read will realize that at that time, Zambia inherited a country that may have had its own problems, like uh, the whole, um, you know, appetite against uh, Africans and so on. But we actually inherited a country which even had gold reserves. Now, what was interesting for me whenever I read about this is that Kenneth Kaunda and his team were just passionate about Zambia. They were very patriotic and they wanted the best for Zambians. What was a problem for them is that they didn't have the team of men and women that we have now with a lot of education. But because of their passion and patriotism, they actually built a Zambia, which when you look back, how I wish the next government would have built on what they had done. You know, they, they actually started exploiting the resources that we have in the country. They, the resources that they generated, they started building up very important um, uh, institutions. Zambia had the best airline, the Zambia Airways. If you read about it, it was a performing airline. Zambia set up the whole mining industry under ZCCM, and the whole economy was in the hands of Zambians. And then you can think of the Zamhots, which was a, a company where whatever people produced, they knew where to take it. And uh, in agricultural language, you call it the aggregator. So if you produced a lot of tomatoes, you knew, you knew it would find itself in Zamhot. And uh, we were able to make chunks tomatoes. We were able to make purees and all sorts of things. So basically, we had an industry going in Zambia. We were able to make our own uh, tires. You had the Dunlop. We were making our own bicycles in Chipata and so on. Now, this is the danger of change. In 1991, Zambia was all, oh, there was euphoria that change must take place. Kenneth Kaunda, in his humility, handed over the power. What happened? Every single th thing that he had built was thrown to the, to, you know, to the pit. All the companies were sold. Uh, the economy of Zambia was moved out of the hands of Zambians. And it, it, 20 years showed that we were no longer that Zambia. We now started seeing a lot of uh, potholes. People who had been working in companies were retrenched. Others even died from, uh, from, from uh, depression because they've never been paid their money. 
And some are still languishing as I speak right now. And uh, when I look back, I say, oh my God, when we talk about change, can Zambia be careful? Because that 20 years, for every Zambian, we must step back, analyze it, and look at the impact it has had on Zambia. So in 2011, when the Patriotic Front came into power, fortunately for us, President Michael Chilufia Sata, may he so rest in peace, came from the school of UNIP and the school of the MMD. So he looked, analyzed, and realized that there's no way you can talk about development in this country without stepping back and building a new Zambia. And this new Zambia, first of all, the foundation should be infrastructure development. And therefore, there was an analysis of what is it that we needed. One is that we needed road networks. And why was this important? Because certain critics have even said, can you eat roads? Yes, to be able to move goods and services. When you're talking about agricultural products, you need road networks. If you want to participate in commerce and trade, you need road networks. So in essence, you can eat roads because they bring business to the table and they can actually move the country forward. The second thing is that even when you talk agriculture or anything, you cannot do it without energy. And this is why Michael Chilufia Sata and his team decided investment in energy. Because when you talk industrialization, you need energy. When you talk agriculture, fisheries, livestock, you need energy. And, and so on and so on. The list is endless of what you need energy for. And this is why we put up this infrastructure. The third infrastructure is the whole communication. Because if you're going to move things fast, goods and services, commerce and trade, you need communication. And this is why towers were put all over the country to make sure that the, 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 the communication improves in the country. Then the other infrastructure, of course, is education. You know, they say that an educated, an educated nation is a wealthy nation. And this is exactly why in 10 years, the Patriotic Front has moved from three universities in 47 years to an additional six universities. And not only that, we realize that you can not only have degrees, you need artisans. And this is why we put up so many trade schools and colleges so that they support the, the people that are being churned out of universities with degrees and they need artisans to push. For an engineer in mining, they will need a heavy duty equipment repair expert. They need an electrician. They need a mechanic and so on and so on. So four, we invested in health. It is said that a healthy nation is a productive nation. And therefore, we needed to make sure that we move the levels of health of our people beyond what we inherited. We did not only, people talk about building hospitals, but I think what is really de the defining prob uh, uh, success of health in Zambia in the last few years is the establishment of the Public Health Level uh, Institute. Because within the Public Health Institute, you are able to drive community health. You are also able to identify the determinants of health. And this is why infrastructure into water and sanitation had to even be isolated because we are looking at the fact that um, sanitation is a determinant of health. So this is the foundation that the Patriotic Front has done. Now, what needs to happen now is to move from the foundation and scale up that which we have already started. So Zambia is where it is because we lost 20 years. And because what the problem of change is that there are certain leaders, when they take on ownership, they want to undo everything that the other people did. And that is an important lesson for Zambia, 
that we should not just talk about change without really understanding change. I've heard statements like, when we come into power, we shall fix it. And my question is, what is broken that anybody is coming to fix? Because I think we, the patriotic front has fixed. They've laid the ground. And now we are moving forward so that Zambia can actually benefit from the wealth that God has so much given them. We should never, never as a country appear on the list of poor countries in the world. We have so much to benefit from. All we need to do is focus, analyze, critically think, and move the country forward. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for taking even a historical way of responding to the question, what has got us here? Some people would say, in 1991, things had gone so much down the drain. Our economy was underperforming. There was joblessness. Goods and services were in short supply. Would you disagree, Professor, with the fact that, or the assertion that there was need for change in 1991? Maybe in your assessment, you say we threw everything away that the UNIP era had built, but most people would say maybe time had come for change in 1991. Would you say that is a wrong assessment? Well, um, Martin, the way I'd like to, to compare uh, what happened in Zambia, it was not only Zambia that changed politically because there was this wind of democracy, democracy, so, and also privatization. And I want to contrast it with uh, other countries. For example, during that time, there was the Kenya Airways, uh, there was Ethiopian Airways, and there was Zambia Airways. Out of these three airlines, Zambia Airways was one of the best performing airlines. And in terms of network, it had a huge network. It was flowing into New York, into Europe, and so on. Do you know what our colleagues did? They analyzed. And then they said they are not going to shut down Kenya Airways or Ethiopian Airways. They diagnosed the problem. And then they realized that uh, because at the time of getting independence, they didn't have as many educated people. So the problem they diagnosed was management. So what did the Kenya Airways do? invited just the management and Kenya was was saved. What did uh, uh, Ethiopian Airways do? They obviously diagnosed the problem and it was about management and they, 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 they brought in good management. So for me, I'm, I'm emphasizing the fact that there could have been need for change Maybe because people wanted democracy, people wanted uh, privatization, but change for the sake of change, and you come and take everything and throw it down the drain. I think it is important that we as Zambians learn lessons from that. And as we learn lessons, we do comparisons of what happened in other countries. Even when people look at leaders, and even when they look at uh, the office of the president, they don't look at the presidency. When they build hatred for the person that is sitting there, then whatever good they do, they don't appreciate it. And Professor, coming to your point of people asking what is broken now, some might say our unity has broken. We are less united as a country. What would be your response to that? The, there are certain things that we'll, we have to deal with, but that doesn't require changing the presidency. The, the patriotism is gone, and I've talked about this quite a lot myself, and the way I've explained it is that uh, when I was a student, uh, in my early age, 
I landed in uh, Russia and uh, we were discovered two days later by Zambians. They didn't even care where I came from. For them, I was a Zambian. There were three of us girls and four boys. We were just taken in, looked after, until we were dispatched to our respective places where we were going to study. When you went to the embassy, the ambassador just looked at you as a Zambian. When I went to study in England, it was the same. You'll be seated on the, on the train, you hear somebody speaking Bemba or Lozi or Tonga or whatever. You didn't say, are you Tonga? Or are you Lozi? Or are you Bemba? What you said is, were you, are you Zambian? And it was so nice to meet a Zambian. And all that is broken. But it doesn't, it cannot be attributed to an office. It is something that we need to analyze and understand why. And I'll tell you something as somebody who has traveled widely in this country. You know what is so interesting, Martin, is that when you are in the rural part of Zambia, nobody talks tribe. People receive you, they are so happy to see you. This whole uh, disunity is actually in the, uh, in the big cities like Lusaka. And I think it's much more amongst politicians. It's, it's politicians that are promoting this. I hear you when you talk about um, people in rural areas uh, and maybe other parts of the country. They simply see fellow Zambians because it becomes very difficult for a person like me married to someone who is from Chamakubi in Mumbwa area and I'm from the north and even if I carry the name Banda I am not from the eastern and my yeah. nieces and nephews are Tongas and some of them have roots in Rwanda um, and that's how futile the notion of tribe um, can be other than celebrating uh, the best we have from our cultural perspective. Professor? In fact, uh, Martin, if you want uh, even to bring it home, I was telling some people the other day mm -hmm. that how can I even talk tribe in my own home? Because my, my kids, it's just that I carry the name Luo because of my profession. And having been girls, we needed to promote dad's name. So two of us remained Dr. Luo's. But my, my, my husband was from the Eastern province. So my children don't carry the name Luo. They're Mandas. So where do I even start talking about uh, a tribe when uh, <laughs> my kids are, are, are from elsewhere? And I've got a brother who is uh, married to uh, Elozi. So in his home, we have Mukwandi Chivesa Kunda. We have Iswani Chivesa Kunda. So how, where do you even start? So for me, I find it really very interesting when people are talking about these things because uh, there's so much intermarriage now that uh, this is a wrong time to even talk about tribe really and i think that's why i'm saying this is something we should address at personal level and and professor just to to to, to make sure we i am um, fairer to 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 what also has taken place in social media there is a video which showed you as speaking tribal in uh, 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 on Chulvi Island. Is, is that something um, that you spoke uh, inadvertently or it's actually not true? Actually, it is uh, something that uh, those that are tribal wanted to promote. And uh, fortunately, you, the interviewer, come from exactly where I come from. I was saying, we, when you die, because in that particular um, campaign, we had lost our member of parliament. So I was saying, when you die in where we come from, have you heard of a person inheriting 
who is not from that family. So since the person who died was from PF, we should then have somebody from PF take over. So mm. with social media, you know, you can cut bits and pieces and add what you want and exaggerate it. So that's exactly what, what it was. And uh, I can tell you that in that campaign, the moment we hit Chilubi, there was a lot of euphoria because of just we came in with a ban. So our competitors had to find a way of, uh, of uh, creating a story out of nothing. Professor, we'll take a little break. And when we return, I will ask you what your ambition is. <laughs> Entrepreneur looking for a place to work from? Do you want to develop your leadership skills? Do you have an idea or business you'd want to scale? Are you looking for a place to host training and learning events? If you answered yes to any of the questions, then Impact Tableau Saka is the place for you. It is a social innovation hub that is part of Impact Up Global Network that supports various entrepreneurs and social innovators. Our services, among others, include co-working space, event hosting, incubation and acceleration programs, capacity building in leadership and business. Professor, welcome back. My next question is, what is your ambition? What is your highest aspiration for our country? Another way of asking this question, Professor, is why should the people of Zambia vote for you and your presidential candidate, His Excellency, President Edgar Jagwalungo. As a party that has just been in government for the last 10 years, we have um, built a foundation. And uh, let me try and put it in context uh, that we have uh, prioritized infrastructure. And I think we are now at a stage where we can propel things like industrialization, diversification into tourism, uh, diversification into agriculture, fisheries and livestock, and uh, bringing the participation of all Zambians at different levels in these areas. So the reason why we, have, we are saying vote us back into office is because we are the ones who know what we have done and where we want to take Zambia. And I think we brought Zambia to a level where the next steps is getting lives from, from household level to national level at a different level by reducing poverty at household level and reducing poverty at national level. And I don't think Zambia is ready to go and start experiments again. Martin, as a scientist, you know that one of the most dangerous things to do is to do an experiment without assumptions. And what are those assumptions, Professor, that you, as the Patriotic Front, have made? The assumptions that we had made was that you cannot develop without infrastructure. And we started our experiments on what, how infrastructure can go positive or negative. And we've been able, able to prove that our experiment of uh, infrastructure development is yielding results. Today, we can say that uh, we have generated enough power for us to start our diversification program. 
we have managed to put communication activities across Zambia, even in the remotest part of Zambia. So if I want to inquire on anything, or even want to look at social media or any other types of platform, it's possible to see it even from Chavuma or from Mafinga. We made an assumption that we needed a healthier nation. So we embarked on our experiment in investment in health, and we've been able to show that uh, some of even the most difficult things that we had, such as cholera, is behind us. What we are battling with is a worldwide problem, which none of us in the world ever anticipated the COVID-19. Even that, I think Zambia is doing pretty well. Let me now turn, Professor, to the question of our relationship with power. Somehow along the way, we create the notion that we need one person who we then hero worship in order for us to get to where we want to be as a country. For you and President Lungu, how have you resolved this aspect of hero worship? And as a party, how is that panning out? How do you relate with your fellow leaders? I think one of the lessons we learned from President Sata was humility. He was one of the most humble presidents I've ever seen. In fact, I recall we used to call him King Cobra. Mm -hmm. And there were times some of us would ask him and say, what has changed? So I think that uh, all these things depends on the people. And uh, there was such an open door policy to state house, to wherever, and, uh, and so on and so on. When President Lungu was uh, voted in, and you recall his critics, they said, oh, He's saying he has no vision, he's going to wear the shoes of President Sat. He must have his own vision. But President Lungu said, no, I'm wearing President Sata's shoes. And I think one of the things that uh, people can, again, credit President Lungu is uh, the fact that even if people may want to hero worship, worship him, he's refused to be hero worshiped. He's a very humble president full of humility. Even his postures as he walks, you can see. That is not one of those who just go around, you know, saying, here I come as president. I think these whole things are at personal level. And you can decide not to be hero worshipped. Thank you, Professor. And my final question is to invite you to imagine you win the 12th of August elections. And it's the day of being sworn in. And just before the president, you are, on whose ticket you are standing, just before he steps onto the podium to be sworn in, you have the chance to whisper in his ear in order to give him the most valuable piece of advice. And bearing in mind, because you are one ticket, that piece of advice applies to you. What is that piece of advice you would whisper to President Lungu as he steps up to go to the podium to be sworn in? Yeah, the piece of advice I would tell him because first of all, I'll preface this with, with my advice, that um, in the stadium, there will be a lot of people from, from all over Zambia. So I will say to him, I say, President Lungu, look at all these people, they're expecting results from us. So let's hit the ground running. We don't have time. Professor, and President Lungu, I wish you all the best. And thank you for sharing your reflections, but more so for the Zambia you would want to work for should you be elected. 
on 12th of August 2021. Thank you so much. And uh, indeed, as I said earlier, it's a an honor and privilege. Thank you very much. Having listened to the dialogue and followed my conversation with our guest, I now invite you to look at the drawing that emerged out of that dialogue. Take time to see the contours, the colors, the images that are reflected on the painting, on the drawing. And pay attention to what the drawing evokes in you. What are the feelings? What are the thoughts that are ignited by you looking at the painting? What thoughts does the painting generate in you with regard to your own leadership? What thoughts, feelings, and images does this painting evoke in you with regard to the future of our country? What else does this painting make you think and feel? Kindly share your reflections on this channel so that we can continue the dialogue on the future of the country we all love, on the future of our nation, 